So, <clears throat> all right. Um, so um, we are so excited to have um, Shile um, this is afternoon for the both of us. So we're so glad to have you, um, Shile, on International Students Office Hour. So, um, and then we would love for you to just briefly introduce yourself just for everybody to hear. Uh, I'm introducing, um, how deep do you want me to introduce myself? Like very deep or just? Selfish, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have, my name is Olashini Adelinte. I'm from Nigeria. Um, school in Dalhousie. I'm doing my master second year trying to wrap up. Um, so I'm doing my master's in computer science, specializing in big data analytics. Um, yeah, do I need to tell you about work at home? Or, I think that's all. Uh, that's about it. Um, that's, that's about it. Yeah, that's fine. So, um, so I have a question for you on that, Shile. Yeah. Yes. So my question was, considering the fact that you were working when you finished your first degree in Nigeria, so why did you decide to pursue a master's degree? Like, at, at what point did you realize that, okay, it was time for you to pursue your master's degree, considering the fact that you were working and you had the opportunity to really garner experience um, that was related to your field of study uh, from industry experts? Okay. Um, I always knew I was going to go for my master's. Like, I always knew I wanted to do my master's. Like, I always want to get more. And I knew, like, okay, BSc was just, like, the starting point. I would surely do my master's. But one thing I knew for sure was I didn't want to do my master's in Nigeria. Because, like, after going to, like, the University of Badon, like, where else do you want to go to for your master's? <laughs> so, like, yeah. <laughs> Where else do you want to go for your master's? Okay, I'm like, and I'm like, okay, then I, then I was able to get a job. Then, so I've always been there, like, while you're still trying to get a job, while you're still trying to advance on your, on your jobs, on your professional life, you're still trying to, like, get more, you're still trying to, like, aim for more, like, trying to get, like, what's the next level? What happens when something else happens? How do you get to gain more knowledge? And that was when I started applying to schools. Like, and deciding the country to go to, I'm not a big fan of the United States. Yeah. Um, I started doing some research. Sorry about that. I started doing some research, then I discovered, then I discovered Canada, then, then you get to know about the processes of Canada, then how it's easy for you to, like, work the work permit, how you could work. And I started applying to schools then. I applied to a lot of schools. I got some admissions also. I got some admission from like, I got admission from UK, US, and Saudi Arabia, and Canada. But at some point of all those periods and times, I rejected some. For, even though it was for some reasons. And yeah, so I always tried. So I got the Canadian one. I got the best in Canada and I felt, this should be good, like, this should be something I, sh I want to do, and, and it's master's in computer science, and I should, that should be good, and that was when I just decided that, okay. So, so, uh, so it, it, I think from what you said, um, it is fair to say that you look beyond um, the graduate program itself, like, the opportunity to be able to have growth opportunity, like, in work experience after your studies, so is it fair to say probably that's one of the things that really attracted you to Canada? Yes, yes, yes. That was one of the, that was one of the major things that attracted me to Canada. And yeah, the opportunities after school matter because you're trying to like, like you're trying to like, you should be able to look for where to apply your knowledge also. You're not just trying to gain knowledge and just trying to like just acquire it for yourself. You should be able to like acquired some knowledge and applied somewhere else to like for the betterment of everyone and that's one of the motives like where I could be able to work and use my knowledge to do something and that's why I preferred Canada. Right so um, 
I know you to be a very smart um, and brilliant student anyways. Um, so why didn't you opt for a PhD program? Um, so what, what, what is it like? Why masters? Um, since you're also doing computer science now, so why don't you just, um, didn't you just opt for a PhD program? Were you scared? <laughs> yes, I'm scared. No, and again, like, like I watched the former, I watched the previous video and I discovered the speaker I was doing his PhD and I applied from Bachelor of Science, from, from, a, from a Bachelor program to a PhD program. Wow, that was, I was, I was wild to that. I'm like, <laughs> okay, when I wanted to apply for, like, I've, I've always been applying for a master's course. In Canada here, in some other schools also, like in my school, it's, you could convert when you have done your master's and you want to go for a PhD. It's way easier that way. You just continue, you just continue the process. But you get your master's degree, then you keep, then you keep going. Probably with, you keep going deeper with your research to get. But I just thought I was not just ready for that PhD thing yet. Like, I just felt, you know, like this is, this is, this is not this is not for me yet. Like, like even though I finish my master's, like oh. I'll probably take a break okay. to the industry mm-hmm. before I go for my PhD. If I really, if I want to do my PhD. Awesome. But like I'm thinking about this right now. Like that's that's what I'm thinking about right now. But surely I'm gonna take a break off school. Even though for like one year or two years, go and go, go to the industry get some industry experience to what I've actually learned. Then if I want to come back to use that for my PhD, cool. And that's 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 what that's how I that's how I think things and that's how I decide things like and that's just me. Canadian so, schools Canadian schools will still offer you the opportunity to start your PhD with a BSc program, right? A BSc I am not that sure. It depends. I feel it depends. I've seen, okay, I've seen two conversions in my pro- program. I've seen two conversions from a master's to, to a PhD. Sure. And the two conversions I've seen are because they had a, pro- they, they came in for a master's program again. So this is their second master's. And the, after one year, they discovered that, oh, since they have a master's before and they could just accelerate them. So those ones, they just change it. And it has to be a letter, it has to be an approval by a supervisor. It has to be a supervisor pushing it for you, not you. Okay. So, because, uh, so the requirements for PhD in most schools in Canada, if I'm not wrong, is a master's with, with papers in, in, top, in, top research, in, in top conferences. Like, that is part of it. Like, that is, they want the one comprising like is if you like data science, they want uh, your paper, your, your your paper should be in like ACM and all those top top tiers um, conferences. Like your paper should be there, like with your masters. If you have a master's and you know, like so many schools might like might not even consider you with your masters only. They want to see what they want to see your work. Not just your work, your work in top conferences. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's it. So that's, and that's how, like, my school, most schools, most schools in Canada, and that's how they do. Some schools will accept you with just a master's, but if you want to go to, like, the top schools in Canada, like, like, maybe, like, top 10 schools, because this is the feedback from one, from, from a colleague of mine that is trying to apply for a master's in, is it, is it university of, one investment, then she was trying to apply them. It has to, like, she, she has to provide her papers also, like, what work has she done and, and which conference has she, has, she has, has they accepted her from her paper and that stuff like that. Okay. Um, so um, let, let's come back to you. Um, so when it was time for you to start your um, admission processes and all of that, so what were you looking for in a school, like, you have um, different options to apply to different schools. So what were your top um, um, qualities of <laughs> what you want to see in a school for you to make your choice? Okay. I'll, I'll talk about how my admission processes went in Canada. So I applied to like five schools in Canada. 
Yes, I got admission in one. Yes, one. Yes, one. And which is that house? Yeah, it's a one. Out of five, it was only the house that gave you admission. Yeah. Um. So like, I started from I started from the top. Like, so it was like out of the five schools I picked, I picked University of Montreal. Okay. Is it invest? I know McGill's University. U, um, University of Alberta. I didn't apply to U of T, University of Toronto, because it was way, 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 way competitive. And then I applied to, this, I applied to, like, I applied to five universities and I got admission from U of Yeah, the reason why it's like that is because computer science is way, way competitive. And it's when you get like when you get in you you like even when you're in you you'll be having issues with classes like the classes are are, are capped so if you really want a class like you really want to attend a class you have to apply so early when the class is full it's full it's full so that's how yeah, most that's of our classes are full if it's full, it's full there's nothing you can do yeah. so i applied to find yeah. admission in that housing and most of those schools are good, like they are good. They like they are good, but they have rankings online that gives them a ranking. But what what makes them so good is just the instructors in there, the kind of labs you get. Like a school better than the labs might not have the data science labs we have. But data science, the data analytics part of that housing only cannot might not give you that good ranking on the overall ranking. I understand. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, so it's it's just all about the individual course you want to do. That house might be good in computer science and some other top schools, yeah. but but the overall ranking of that school is better. So when I got that housing, then I did my research. Then I discovered that oh, they had they had this cool lab in it also, which I tried to like. I spoke to the supervisor, and and that was how I started my surgeon in the data analytics lab also. So you are more of prestige, like top rated schools. You feel that you have yeah. credentials. To be yeah, like maybe that's what you are did to me, though. But <laughs> <laughs> always, always aim for the best. Like don't set like always aim for the best. Like just try keep going for the best. Like keep going for the best. Like don't just think oh I want to set it for a college. I want to set it for so. All universities, don't get me wrong, all universities are good. Like the experience you go to in Canada, in Canadian universities, probably in, in the states, in, in most states' universities, the experience is good. Like you get so many experiences and you just are good. But so it's, it's all about the school, it's all about the experience. And let's just leave the ranking out of it. They are all good schools, trust me. Like they are all good schools. But so as an engineer, we always go for the. You have to have preferences. So yeah, you have to have preferences also. And especially according, you you cut your code according to your size. Yes, yes. And one of the reasons of those schools are because those schools are applied to as schools that didn't require GRE. Okay. Because. Oh. Yeah, we lost you from because. Oh, can you? Yeah, I can hear you. Now. Because I don't know the GRE. I don't, I don't think I want the GRE. Because you have to require GRE. I think you know, still have Bata requires GRE also. So I don't want to. I don't want to do GRE. And so I apply to those schools that. And again, that those schools that actually don't require me to send my transcript physically. And the only school I sent my transcript physically to was Dalhousie. <laughs> 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 like, it's like, okay, I'm into this, I'm into this Dalhousie school already because I know what I want to get there. And like, okay, when they said, okay, I should send my transcript to them also before they can actually decide my application, I'm like, should I do it? Should I not do it? Because it's expensive. Then, like, you have to spend, like, you have to send it through DHL, which is like 15,000 there in Nigeria. And then, yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. And, and that, that was the only investor I sent my transcript physically. So when they gave me an admission, I didn't have to send my transcript physically because they had everything they needed. And that was just good for me. So um, can you remember what the um, 
the admission requirements were can you still put it together do something you can remember i think the admission requirement in canada is almost similar to that of the states also because first of all the state of public is composed like it's required in all universities i feel it's like it's required i think why because my system of purpose kept improving as I, as I applied to a school, get rejection, I improved my statement of purpose, and I kept on going that way. So, statement of purpose is sure, like, it's always important in all admissions, like, they always require it. Most Canadian universities require it to write a statement of purpose. Then, you know, the, this course. That's, this is now, this is where you get, this is where you get a little bit. So I always advise, my own advice to people asking me about universities in Canada is just to write IELTS academics. It's, it puts you in a good shape. Some schools require it. Some schools just put it as optional, but every school has it on their website that you should provide it. Few of them make it optional. And you have to be able to prove to them that you can speak English. Yeah, well, Nigeria is an English-speaking nation, and I just didn't want to go through the process of, we well, have to now satisfy them that, that, that we are English-speaking nation by getting to my school again to get a letter that we did some English courses. When I could just write IELTS, and I wrote my IELTS already, I got a good grade, and I just always push my IELTS result into it. So before I started applying to schools, so those five schools I applied to were not just I applied to them at once. I applied to them in a period of like two years. My IELTS was in vogue, like was actually um, still valid. So I so when so I always apply to people, people always want to run away from it. Like there is no shortcut to all these admission processes, and that's why I always advise people. You just have to give some sacrifice. Yeah. So others are going to do IELTS. They require um, GREs for just top schools. I think the only few schools that require GRE in Canada is University of Toronto, University of um, Alberta, and if I'm not sure, some other schools. But those other, other schools won't require GRE. Maybe maybe it cannot get to department requirement, but for computer science, they just just have your just have your good grades, which is a minimum of B minus. When they convert, we have above seventy percent. That's the B minus thing, and so those are the requirements. So our English English test is is, is sure. Um, statement of purpose has to be top notch. Like write the statement of purpose, give people to review, let people review, let people give you feedback. Apply to schools. If they don't, if they don't give you admission, don't give up. Improve your statement of purpose. Show it again to another school. If they don't give it, if they don't say anything good, improve on it, apply to another school. And it keeps getting better. It's not keeps getting better. Because that's what it's going to those schools to speak for you. And it has to just speak well for you and it has to summarize everything you've done and all your everything you bring into the school. Um, and you have to have good grades, that's sure. And I think yeah, that's that's just all it's for Canada. Like and that's just all it's for Canada, I feel. Um <clears throat> how like how expensive are Canadian schools? Um <laughs> because that that's like the most um critical point when it comes to studying abroad and you know, people always want to find a way to um also go to schools that can let them um, at least and so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So now ex expensive. I don't want to say expensive is relative, but can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't want to say expensive is relative, but first of all, we are international students. As an international student in Canada, you pay additional eight thousand and average between that range. Of eight thousand, nine thousand, and like eleven thousand as international differential fee on your tuition fee every year. Our the tuitions are not expensive. It's just the national differential fee that makes tuition fee of international students very, very expensive. So 
the tuition, the tuition is like my tuition is okay. I'll talk. My tuition is like the old tuition for a year in Dalhousie for a master's program, which I did was eighteen thousand dollars for a year. Yeah, the national differential fee is a ten thousand dollars on this. The tuition, real tuition, is eight thousand. Oh. So if a Canadian is doing that same program with me, the Canadian is paying eight thousand dollars. Awesome. While all international students are paying eighteen thousand dollars. So is it is every master's program a two year program, or you can do it in one year based on how probably how good you are? You you do it in one. Yeah, you you can't the way the way most of the programs, if I'm not, the way most of the programs are structured in Canada, it's. It's like a one year, 18 months. Like, you cannot finish in one year. You can finish in like 18 months. You can finish in 18 months. Yeah, 18 months, two years. Like, they always make it open. Like, you come into, like, my master's program is like two to five years. They tell you, is it? <laughs> you can keep and yeah, for a long time. You keep paying it to us, though. You keep paying it because if you keep registering for, you keep registering for the, the cost you keep using for every semester, and you keep paying for it. But like, I can finish in sixteen. You can finish in eighteen months. It's possible. Like I just saw that finish for eighteen months, and eighteen months is just with everybody almost finishing in eighteen months. It's just that your graduation happens at the end of the two years, so it's almost two years. So eighteen months, you're done. By eighteen months, you should have defended. You should have defended your thesis and stuff like that. So it's it's just that it's in months and it wraps up to like two years and everyone thinks it's two years, but the inside job that happens for the thesis is just like 18 months, 20 months. 20 so, months. So, so how, how can um, an average aspiring graduate student have access to funding when um, they have to pay this huge amount of money for like a year, 18,000 Canadian dollars? Yeah. So what are the opportunities for funding like how do we have like professors or departmental funding um, that are available for students so for international students anyways yeah scholarships and all of that yeah there are scholarships available like a lot of scholarships are available but the good part about Canada is that most of the scholarships sit in the school like you only have like few one or two scholarships that is like oh outside like you get and bring in the school. Most of the scholarships sit in the school. You have to like be in school. So as a thesis student, most of your most of the professors have grants. They have grants. They have a project they are working on that has funding. Because in Canada, like in Canada, I don't know about us, but in Canada, most of its complaints come to school. They bring the funds to them to do research for them, and they have the money. So if you are, if you, if you as a professor, you are in charge of the project, funds, there are so many funds available. And if as a student, you're working with a professor on that project, using that project as a this also, or that project as part of your work, you get the funding also. Like there's a funding requirement, there's a funding requirement which goes to your basic First of all, your tuition is covered first. You cover your tuition, then you send the rest to you as stipend, or uh, then you sort all the rest. So there are four warnings available. Like, and apart from that, also, like, there are so many ways of you getting jobs. Like, there's, there's teaching assistantship. You can be a TA to a course where you get some money at the, every two weeks for a semester. Those money. And if, does that does that TA offer you a tuition waiver or just no? It doesn't offer no. TA doesn't offer tuition waiver, but it offers you what TA offers you is just stipend, like yeah. but it doesn't cover the only ones that offer tuition waiver, like you get it from your country, from your own country. You don't get available scholarships that offer then you have to get scholarships that are sitting in the school. And for you to get scholarships that are sitting in the school, you have, which is tied to someone, or which is tied to a graduate chair, you have to be a student first of the school before you can apply to those scholarships. Because there are so many scholarships that you can only apply to 
if you are a student. So you have to be a student first before you can apply to this scholarship. Uh, before you become a student, that means you would have had to pay maybe your first semester. Yeah, you have to pay your first semester. So uh, in most Canadian schools, you would probably have to pay first. Yeah, you have to pay first. You have to pay first. You have to pay first. Then if the money comes in, and yeah, your money can be refunded back to you. So the, 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 yeah. the chances of getting to be to getting um, access to funding from our home countries, they are kind of very limited. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So home country, like no, we Canada doesn't have control over funding that happens in Nigeria. Then funding that happens in Nigeria. Okay, for instance, maybe your school that allows you maybe um, okay. when you are applying, do they have application for like um, scholarship or um, assistantships? Can you apply alongside your normal um, no. application? No. The only thing that can happen, the only thing that can happen is you apply and it's like, okay, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not wrong, you apply then it's professor sees interest in you. Okay. Then takes you over and tells you that hey, he has funding for you based on the work you've done. And that means you have to have stated, you have, you have stated those work in your statement of purpose that you've done this, you've done this, and you're about doing this. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. You're like, oh, I like that student. He's gonna take, he's gonna get, he's gonna send letter to you. And some students also that I know here, they talk to people first. Like I know that I had to speak to a professor first. They got they got the from the professor first before they applied. So you didn't talk to any professor. You just I, I didn't talk to any professor. I just I applied to I applied to that housing and then I did more and then I did more research and I discovered the institute and I applied to the institute and and that was how I did that. that you my when you go to Canada, or you applied. Yeah, I applied back home. Like after I applied to the school, like so when when you apply to the school, it's like okay, this school is a fifty fifty percent chance you might get admission to this school, you might not get admission to the school. So let me start getting myself used to the school. Then you start digging into the school. Like what do they have in terms of my program? So, oh, they have like, a lab. Oh, then oh, what do I need to get? To? What do I need to get to the lab? Some labs actually tell you you have to be a student before you can apply. So I started talking to I started talking to my professor. Then like, um, okay, I was like, okay. Then when I got the admission, I I have my admission and okay. I said send your resume. Send, I said send your resume, send your transcripts, and that was how I sent my. And that was how I got admitted to that. That was how so I got I got my admission and I got accepted to the bigger data analytics lab. And that was how. I started working with as a research assistant in Big Data Analytics Lab. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier, there are just a number of folks out there who probably also want to try to apply to Canadian schools. Mm -hmm. So, what would be your um, advice, your tips? So, I want you to probably like enumerate something they can actually hold on to. Like, okay, um, we're ready to give it all it takes. Yeah. So. Or, they want to be able to see someone who can actually provide that guidance. So what would be your okay. list? What they should look out for? What they should do? Um, the first thing first is say, say money. We know that um, advanced um, schools in advanced countries are kind of expensive. But no, like, let me keep in. People should not be discouraged with the money at first. Like the tuition fee, don't be discouraged. Mm -hmm. If I was discouraged, I wouldn't have applied. You need to apply, get the admission. You can defer admission for like a year or a semester. Like you can defer admission. I deferred my admission for like a while you catch it. Like you're a student. Immediately you get the admission, you are a student. Then you can start getting admission, like start talking to a professor. I start to professors in that school. And if you see that you're a student, like you're they offer your admission and they like you, they just take you in and you come in and you just, most of the things. So if, if you keep having the mindset that I need to have the tuition, I need to have a scholarship if I apply to Canadian schools, we'll 
who we'll just keep, who we'll just not apply. So, what I always advise people like, first of all, one, do your English test. Like, have those, have those already. Like, have everything you need. Have a copy of your transcripts for application. And to apply to Canadian school, you, you probably wouldn't mind spending money. Like, it's, I see that as an investment. Mm-hmm. You can you can apply for a very competitive course like Thomas Science, like all those competitive courses. I have like three schools back up. Apply to those two schools. I know it's it's, it's expensive paying like three hundred dollars an application, but apply to the first school, get the feedback. If there's any feedback, if it's your student that's proposing to improve on, just improve on it. They will always give you the same reason as they have so many applications and yeah. that, that's, 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 the, that's the standard of the rejection. But apply to schools, write the English, improve on your writing, apply, don't get discouraged. Look for a course that you want to do. Don't get discouraged about the money yet. Get the admission. When you get the admission, then you look at the next step on how you want to do it. So what so one thing about it is like eighteen thousand dollars actually my first year. The second year is reduced because you don't pay as much in the first year than the second year of the masters. The second year is way, way reduced. But the national professional fee still goes on the two. So it still makes it go up. So but it's still it's way reduced than the first one. So I would just advise you to apply to schools. Then when you get the admission and start talking to professors or when you apply start talking to professors in school and see which of them are can are doing the same research and you don't want to bother a professor that is that you don't feel you feel guys are not doing the same research same similar research you really want to talk to professors that you are doing the same research you are doing the same work with that you feel he might be he or she might be interested in the work you're doing write down the work it's probably a proposal, just send a proposal to it. It might not be fully sketched. Just, just scale it, just send something, let him see how you think. And if it's interested in you, you would send, you would, you would surely like email back and tell you, like, okay, let's, let's, let's schedule like a Skype interview. And you talk, you just saw yourself in the Skype interview. And if it doesn't go well, then you keep trying. You don't give up. Like, Nigeria, as Nigerians, we don't we don't give up. We just keep trying it. We don't know how to give up. <laughs> we don't know how to give up. We don't give up. You keep trying. If you want to go to Canada, you keep trying. Like it's trust me, it's actually way easier to get the visa in Canada, get admission than to actually survive in school. Mm. It's way, it's very, very, it's like, I get, when it's when it start the school, like, getting the admission is just, like, the, like, the easiest thing that I would do. <laughs> like, it's, like, the easiest thing. Yeah, so, why, why, why you're giving the, your tips and your advice, let me quickly ask, um, so, do you have to pay part of the tuition before you leave your home country, or you can come to Canada and then also to what was it like? The first time is now. Then I want, I want to separate these two questions. Okay. Is it most ad, okay? Is it the first year, like yeah. the first, first year, year or your first semester, or whatever? Before you move to Canada at all, did they does, does, does the school want you to pay a certain amount to guarantee your admission or what? Yes, they, yes, they want you to pay. Like my school required me to pay just two hundred dollars. $200. Yeah. That's, and that, that's separate from application fee, right? Oh, that's, separate from, that's separate from application fee. Just $200. Just $200. I, just, okay. just $200. I paid, I paid, like, this is me. I paid, if I left NG, I paid just $200 on my tuition fee. Because that was the requirement for me to guarantee. Like- but some schools, some, it might differ in some schools. I really don't know. I don't know. It's probably after I get the admission, they tell you that condition. But some schools, I think I know someone that said I require them to pay like half of the tuition. Okay. But my school was just two hundred dollars, and you can pay the rest before the deadline of the semester runs out. And in Canada again, they allow you pay by ten. You pay by like 
you we pay by 10 here, like your teacher should say it's just first semester. They might tell you the oh, what you see on the on the stuff website is like the tuition for the whole year. But what when this one start paying is you pay by 10. Like I pay by I pay by 10, like by 10, by 10, they they deduct my money from my from, uh, I won't be lesser than that. So, uh, maybe because I'm school, but I know you have to pay like a token just to guarantee that you're coming to the school and just to reserve your spot because the slots are limited and they want to know if you're actually coming or they should give the spot to someone else. And that's just it. That's true. That's true. Wow. So um, basically, those are the questions that we have for you. So, and um, we really appreciate your time, your advice, your wealth of experience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, cheers.